Road to War. Imperialism, local conflicts, involved into war. There were many causes for war. And the war we're talking about leading into is World War I, of course. There was economic competition among the nations of the world that, were, that had experienced and were experiencing industrial um, expansion. So everyone is competing for the lead in trade, in world trade. There are political and strategic advantages that each country is vying for. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, that strategic advantage. But also another thing that was happening, and not just in America, but around the world, was national and social Darwinism. The idea that your own national identity is superior to anyone else's. In America, there is a renewed sense of manifest destiny. Now, the idea of manifest destiny goes all the way back uh, to colonial era when uh, Jonathan Edwards, who led the first large migration of Puritans into Massachusetts Bay, he talked about uh, that it was the destiny of those Puritans to establish a perfect community, a perfect church. And that idea spread from there. Uh, we see another resurgence of it in the 1840s and 50s. That idea that it was clear, clearly the destiny or the manifest destiny of Anglo-Americans to spread across the continent from sea to shining sea. But now in the late 1800s and early 1900s, it is a new manifest destiny that reaches beyond the continent and includes other nations of the world. So in other words, an attempt to establish in the perspective of the world that our uh, identity is superior to all others. Another influence during this time period leading up to war uh, was a book written by Alfred Thayer Mahan, The Influence of Sea Power on History. Uh, Mahan was a spokesman for empire building. He believed that the nation's industrial expansion required markets beyond the continent, new markets and raw materials from around the world in order that America, who was on the cusp of becoming the leader in world power. America's not there yet in 1890. But Mahan believes that in order for America to reach that superior place among the powers of the world, that it was important to have a navy. And all nations were, were rivaling one another for sources beyond their own borders. And you need navies to protect those ships that are plying the trade, that are going to new places across the ocean to get resources and to find new markets for the products that uh, America was producing. 
sorry. Um, can I go back? Sorry. I was going to point out the images um, that I had on the page. They should be self-explanatory. Um, so we have all that competition going on, all those causes that is uh, putting nations of the world in a position to lead to war. Now, Mahan had said a Navy was an important. The thing about it is the United States was far behind other countries in building up a modern Navy. In 1886, America was still using wooden ships powered by sails. It won't be until 1886 that they begin, that America begins uh, to try to modernize the Navy, to go from wood to steel, making ships out of steel instead of wood, and to go from sail-powered to coal-powered steam. So utilizing those steam, steam engines uh, that were invented and became so important in railroads now are going to be uh, used in ships. And there in the United States, there's a vested interest between industry and the Navy. As we learned last time, um, industrialization and the mass production of steel was a big industry, a uh, economically important industry in the United States. Um, so the United States is mass producing steel and the Navy needs steel to build those ships, the modern ships. Also overseas trade is important to industry as it is to the Navy. Coaling stations. Now we have these ships that are uh, powered by coal, which produces the steam, but a ship could not carry enough coal to last for a round the world trip. So, the United States is going to have to acquire some territories around the world for coaling stations, places where they know that they can resupply uh, the ships that are involved in that overse overseas trade. They can provide coal for those ships. And as I mentioned, uh, the nations of the world are in competition in building battleships. So they're not just building uh, steel ships powered by coal to ply trade, but as Mahan wrote in his book, these uh, merchant ships that are carrying the products they need to be uh, guarded by battleships to protect their overseas routes. And of course, there is struggle between the nations because of all the competition, competition in industry, uh, this idea of social Darwinism, survival of the fittest, and there's a struggle for preeminence in world trade. Every nation wants to be the leader in world trade. And we can see the political cartoon up here of the time period of the uh, 
This represents John Bull of England, Britain, and of course Uncle Sam of the United States, and they are uh, discussing this competition in shipbuilding. In 1890, all other leading nations are ahead of the United States. England had 80 battleships in 1890. France had 51. Russia had 40. Japan, that small island of Japan, had 67 battleships. Germany had 40 battleships and their plan, their naval plan, was to increase by three ships a year. And they were meeting those that criteria, that goal. While the United States in 1890 had only four modern battleships. This is what those battleships looked like of the day, whether it was British or American or German. They all had a similar um, appearance. And this political cartoon tells a story. In order to be victorious in this competition, the key is ships. The key to victory. So we have all of this competition and the consequences of all of this. One thing is that the attitudes and realities about war change. Now, in 1815, there was a, a meeting of the nations in Europe after Napoleon's defeat, um, I can't remember what it was called right at this moment. Um, almost had it. But there was a meeting of all the nations that came together and they agreed that they would try diplomacy, that they would work together to prevent disputes leading to war. That was 1815. But by 1890 and thereafter, war became acceptable as a means of solving problems between nations. And on top of that, because of the technology and the ability to mass produce weapons it made war more dangerous and more brutal. So you have um, automatic weapons, larger, more explosive, more deadly. Part of this industrial expansion and mass producing products. Another consequence was that the world became divided between enemies, between belligerents. Now, after the Franco-Prussian War, which was a war between Prussia and France, Prussia won. Prussia was under the leadership of a, a chancellor named Otto von Bismarck. And Bismarck, especially after the Franco-Prussian War, as it was called, uh, worked to create alliances between countries that would prevent a them against us. So in other words, he set up a complex system of alliances between the countries of Europe. But After 1900, the world was becoming divided uh, between the belligerents. Bismarck's 
alliance system had broken down. Africa was being carved up between England, Germany, and France. Each of those countries were um, conquering the different areas of Africa. Asia felt the imperial rush of Western nations as well. The Dutch, the British, and the Germans were controlling the East Indies. France took Indochina. The United States, after the Spanish-American War of uh, 1898, the United States claimed the Philippines. Russia was nibbling away at China's outlying provinces. So we can look at this map um, to see the way that the that imperialism, the idea of creating empires, was spreading. You can see the chart down here um, of the different color for the different nations. So. Um, Great Britain has this kind of light green color. And you can see they, of course, have Canada. Um, they have all these countries along the uh, east coast of Africa, including Egypt, down the Nile, uh, South Africa, some over here on the west coast, a little bit right here. All of this, India, Australia, islands. So you can see the world is being carved up. Um, Japan, this dark blue color, is claim, claiming areas of the world. Germany. Germany is claiming uh, different parts of Africa, as you can see on the map. Some in South America. And of course, Central Europe. And over here in the islands, the East Indies. Now America's not, um, while well, America is interested in imperialism, in the United States, there are those who support the ideas of imperialism and those who were anti-imperialism. Uh, but the United States is going to be acquiring islands around the world uh, in the bid to have strategic positions and coaling stations. So the international alliances after Bismarck's system broke down, you have the Triple Alliance, Austria, Hungary, that's one empire, and Germany and Italy. They've all agreed to support one another against enemies. So they're gonna all be on the same side. Now that's gonna change. Um, in 1914, but it was this triple alliance was to prevent the Russo Italian combination. They didn't want Russia and Italy uh, to have a, an alliance that would separate them into one faction. In 1892, um, the Franco-Russian Military Convention established an alliance to counteract the Triple Alliance. They promised military assistance against aggressors. So now you have them against us. France and Russia 
England joined the alliance game, creating an alliance with Japan in 1902. And they establish an entente cordiale with France, which is not quite as binding as an alliance, but it is putting them in a favored position. That was 1904. And there was the Anglo-Russian Entente, which again was a favored position, not a strong alliance. There were smaller alliances, like Russia's pledge to protect Serbia. Serbia was made up of uh, Slavic people, as, and Russia also had a strong uh, population of Slavic people. So Russia is going to pledge to protect Serbia because of their uh, combined uh, ethnic population. Britain had made an agreement to defend Belgium's neutrality. So again, it's, it's not an alliance because Belgium wants to re, remain neutral from any conflict in the rest of Europe. And Britain agrees to protect Belgium's right to neutrality. So in 1914, Europe is divided between the alliance with the uh, allies, Russia, France, England, Ireland. They're on one side of this, these belligerents, and Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy have their own uh, strong alliances with one another. So, again, it's strongly divided, which means that when there are local conflicts that should remain local, instead it's going to bring allies in uh, to help in those local situations that it's going to cause it to spread to larger areas and, and eventually to the world war. Some of those local wars that I mentioned, there was the war between Russia and Japan over uh, both of them wanting to claim Manchuria and Korea. Well, that Russo-Japanese war was won by Japan and Russia was left humiliated. And incidentally, it was the United States President Theodore Roosevelt who was able to mediate a peace agreement between Russia and Japan. Then there were the wars in the Balkans. Now this Russo-Japanese War um, was 1905, I believe. Then there were wars in the Balkans. Italy versus Turkey. There was conflict between Italy and Turkey over African territory that both claimed. That was 1912. Then there was conflict between Turkey and Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria, and Montenegro, those Balkan countries. Again, over African territory, Turkey lost as the larger European powers intervened on the side of the Balkan powers. Then in 1913, Bulgaria fought with their former allies for more land. Bulgaria lost and Romania gained territory. Then in 
Now, I mentioned earlier that there was this sense of nationalism that was spreading around the world. So I want to look in particular now at nationalism among the Balkan countries. The Balkan countries um, were controlled either by Austria-Hungary or by Turkey. And the Balkan countries are wanting liberation from those empires. They want independence. They want to establish their own superiority. All those countries identified themselves as pan-Slavic. The Balkan, those people who lived in the Balkan countries. And all of them counted Russia as their chief ally. Again, because Russia also had a large population of pan-Slavic. So there's, this is getting right up to 1914, tensions and looming troubles expound. They are uh, progressing, they are spreading. The Austro-Hungarian Empire struggles with their multi-ethnic empire. Um, you have the Austrians of Germanic descent, and then you have the Hungarians, um, and even more than just those two, um, there are several ethnic groups that are part of the Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they're each one feeling nationalism. So they're not, they're not wanting to be suppressed or um, inferior to Austria or uh, Russia. Russia was trying to hold back revolution in Russia ever since 1905. As you have uh, the White Army and the Red Army conflict, you have the Bolsheviks rising. So they've been trying to stave off revolution in their own country ever since 1905. France was still smarting from loss of, of the Franco-Prussian War. France lost some territory due to that, because they lost that war. And Germany was struggling with social and political unrest. So you have all of this going on. You have the competition for navies, uh, the, comp the competition to gain superiority as far as nationally. And then we have the catalyst that it's going to set the match to the bonfire that will become a con conflagration of World War I. And that is the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand on July the 28th, 1914. They were in, the Archduke and his wife were in Serbia. They were having a goodwill tour in Sarajevo when a Serbian nationalist named Gavrilo Princip assassinated the Archduke and his wife as they were touring. Now, he had tried once before. Uh, everybody knew the route that uh, the Archduke and his party were going to take through Sarajevo so at an earlier point in the tour, there was an attempt at an assassination, assassination uh, but it was unsuccessful and it didn't stop the cavalcade. They continued on with their tour and then eventually uh, Prince Zip managed to uh, kill the Archduke and also to kill his wife. This was 
headlines uh, in American papers. Heir to the Austrian throne was assassinated. Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and um, the Emperor Joseph was almost on his deathbed. So, it, I mean, it was in the near future that Ferdinand uh, would have taken over that empire. The headline reads, wife by his side was also shot to death. Earlier attempt on their lives failed. Now, the reactions because of this assassination. In Austria-Hungary, they declare war on Serbia, July the 28th, the very day um, that it happened. The very next day, Russia announced that they were going to mobilize their army in support of Serbia. That was July the 29th. In Germany, because they had um, this alliance with Serbia, they're going to give Austria, Germany's going to give Austria what is called a blank check. In other words, Germany said, we'll give you whatever you need, do whatever you need uh, for this war. With Russian mobilization, Germany declared war on Russia on August the 1st. France, being bound to Russia, found itself at war. England, bound to France, declared war on Germany August the 4th. Britain was committed to defend Belgium's neutrality, and of course Britain's colonies around the world join in. And you see the the uh, headlines in the Washington Times. Austria has chosen war. Typical Serbian soldiers and their associated equipment. Mediation rejected except to prevent spread of conflict. This uh, represents that blank check. Germany shaking hands with Austria saying, uh, we got your back here. Germany declares war. All Europe is in arms. And down here, if you can read these headlines, Italy breaks the Triple Alliance and France calls out her war army. So 1914, August the 4th, will begin what becomes the World War. As far as America, America in the beginning declares neutrality. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was president by this time and he made the statement in regarding to the war in Europe, that the United States would remain impartial in thought as well as in action. That was August the 4th, 1914. But it was impossible for the United States to maintain partiality for a number of reasons. Um, the United States had a large German population. Uh, they had um, Italian immigrants living in the United States. So uh, the majority of Americans in 1914 wanted to remain uh, neutral. They didn't want to get involved. It had not been the United States tradition to
to get involved in European affairs, European conflicts. But uh, we have this political cartoon of Uncle Sam carrying these boards advertising peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But on the back side of that, war ammunition for sale, orders filled promptly. Now what that meant was that the United States is going to sell arms, ammunition to the Allies. U.S. banks loan France money. United States become the main suppliers for the Allies for war materials. American volunteers go to fight in France along with the, the French soldiers. As this image, American fighters in the Foreign Legion, 1914 to 1918. American volunteer pilots formed the Lafayette Escadrille in France, that is a air force that would include American pilots as well as French pilots. And of course it's named the Lafayette Escadrille because of the French hero of the American Revolution. And this this would have been the t planes, the type of planes that these uh, pilots flew in World War I. <coughs> Headlines in the United States papers that reflect the, the incidents, the things that are going to lead to America's entry into war. First of all, the Lusitania is sunk. 1,000 probably are lost. This is the ship, the Lusitania, which was a British ship, but it carried uh, over 120 some American passengers. And they were all lost. So you have uh, over 100 Americans killed. As the Lusitania was targeted by German submarines. This will be the first war that will use submarines. And the German submarine uh, part of their navy was very active and successful. Now the Lusitania was not the only American ship, I'm sorry, was not the only passenger ship that was targeted, but it is the one that uh, is really going to cause uh, the newspapers to exploit this uh, and it becomes a sensation. Now, it was not known by Americans who took passage on this ship that, but in the holes in the bottom of the ship um, were thousands of dollars of war ammunition, war supplies. So this is really going to begin to change Americans' minds about not getting involved. And then a telegram, telegram from Germany to Mexico is leaked to the press. And this is a headline, Germany seeks an alliance against us. Ask Japan and Mexico to join her. And this paper will give you the full text of Germany's proposal of, of that instance. It's called the Zimmerman telegram. And it was asking Mexico, Germany was asking Mexico to take up arms against the United States, promising Mexico that Germany would help them regain all of the territory that they lost to the United States. So April 16, 
1917. Already three years into the war. War is declared. The president calls for volunteers. The United States joins the allies against Germany. The United States now needs men. German fleet is held. Big army planned. So May the 7th, 1915 is when the Lusitania was sunk. March the 1st, 1917 was when the Zimmerman telegram became public. And then April 6th, just a few weeks later, America declares war.